I'm Andy Kingston. I'm a tutor at uh, St. John's College in Santa Fe. Uh, this is my 16th year at the college, though it doesn't seem that long. It actually has been. Um, before I, I was here, I taught in, in Boston and some other, other places as well. I did my graduate work at Boston University where I was in a, in a disciplinary program where I studied literature, philosophy, music, had classes with Elie Wiesel and Saul Bellow and Jeffrey Hill and um, Juliet Floyd. There were uh, uh, some wonderful people there. And, um, and I was playing a lot of music there. I was uh, an apprentice uh, for playing what people call jazz. And so when uh, I thought about a book to bring, I, I, to talk about today, I, I thought about the Du Bois for a, a number of reasons, um, and I'll read a passage in a minute, but maybe I've been thinking about the relationship between music and writing about music um, for a long time, um, and I've been thinking about it a lot this year, um, partly because I've been home playing music and reading, um, partly because the world has asked questions of us this year in uh, all sorts of ways um, and uh, has made me think again about things I've been thinking about for a long time. When I was in graduate school, uh, I was playing music quite a bit in Boston and um, thinking about this thing called jazz, whatever that is. And um, one of my good friends was the assistant for Saul Bellow, who had been friends with, or was friends with Ralph Ellison. Um, and he, you know, suggested I read some of Ralph Ellison's um, prose works on, on, on jazz. Um, and that led me to Albert Murray, who was also good friends with Ralph Ellison, um, and a book called Stomping the Blues, which was written in the 70s, but um, was in the news again in the 90s, um, partly because he had been the sort of intellectual... I don't know, godfather of the, of the Jazz at Lincoln Center program, which was opening up in New York City at the time, uh, uh, led by Wynton Marsalis, and there was uh, lots of discussion about what it would mean to take jazz and put it at Lincoln Center. Um, and those questions were about art, uh, about the relationship between um, a music that comes from uh, the African-American, the black American tradition, what it means for that music to have a home in Lincoln Center, what that music looks like, and so uh, questions of race and music and aesthetics and politics and art and um, and novelists and literature and and what Albert Murray calls the blues idiom uh, in America, which is not just what we would think of blues and jazz, but is an entire um, way of being in the world or responding to the world through words, music, voice, um, and I've been thinking about that for a long time as a as a white kid trying to learn how to play black American music, as Nicholas Payton calls it, um, and what that means. Um, I didn't just really spend a lot of time thinking about the boys until I got to St. John's, um, where we read um, the souls of black folk in the senior seminar. Uh, when I first got here, we only read selections of it. It's a, it's a book that has so many parts and does so many things that um, it's easy to find parts to read. It has lots to say about liberal education, those parts we, we've read for a long time. I think one of the things I'm, I'm happiest about uh, during my time here is that I was uh, sort of advocated for when I was able to reading the whole thing, which we do now, and I, I really think there's a, a virtue to taking the whole book when we can and thinking about how it holds together as a whole. He frames every, or he introduces each chapter with a, a little segment of music. Um, he doesn't say what it is, uh, so I don't know if we're supposed to, I think we're supposed to go to the piano and play it and hear for ourselves and either recognize or not recognize what he's quoting at the beginning of each chapter. And so part of the task of, of or part of the reason I'm interested in the book is that it, it invites us to, to listen um, to these 
to these little snippets of, of what he calls the sorrow songs, but they are the sort of African-American spiritual tradition. These sorrow songs frame, frame the work, and, and in the, in the final chapter of the book is called The Sorrow Songs, and, and he has this paragraph, through all the sorrow of the sorrow songs, there breathes a hope, a faith in the ultimate justice of things. The minor cadences of despair change often to triumph and calm confidence. Sometimes it is faith in life, sometimes a faith in death, sometimes assurances of boundless justice in some fair world beyond. But whichever it is, the meaning is always clear, that sometime, somewhere, men will judge men by their souls and not by their skins. Is such a hope justified? Do the sorrow songs sing true? And it's this question, do the sorrow songs sing true, that I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming back to again right now. It's a, it's a really difficult question. Um, what, and, or, it's even a difficult question to ask, what does it mean for something to sing true? But, but what does it mean to hear that tradition? Well, it means to be invited into a conversation with the voices um, that hold the lineage to that tradition. So for me personally, it's Elaine Carrington. Um, uh, when I was in Boston, uh, I started playing with a saxophone player named Herman Johnson, who was a uh, had sort of well-known band with young musicians. He would always, you know, sort of cycle young musicians that guy came John Blackwell and with Prince played with him and then there was a um, there's all sorts of groups uh, people came through his group and I he I was on a wedding gig and he looked at me and he says when you play with me you'll wear better shoes so I was like two things I'm gonna buy new shoes and uh, I'm gonna get to play with Herman so uh, he, you know eventually after a few years he called me um, and wanted to rehearse he wanted to, they had some gigs and I played with him off and on for seven years. But the first rehearsal, I thought I was going to his house. It turns out I was going to Elaine Carrington's house. Uh, and Elaine, and Herman was staying there at the time, and Elaine was a singer. So you know, to, to be invited into a, into a tradition. So when I first show up at Elaine's house, I walk in, I met Elaine, I didn't know uh, her, and, and you know she would sing with, with Herman, usually one song at the end of the third set, you know, come on at the end. Um, and there was a big pot of food, huge, Thing of spaghetti. I don't know if she was preparing a meal. It was one of those big, you know, tins that I, they had off to a, I don't know if it's a church function or a Rotary Club or a VFW thing. I don't know. Um, but first thing before we rehearsed, I had to eat, sit down. Um, you know, welcome to the home. So to be to be invited in um, to the home and be fed uh, was my introduction to my apprenticeship with Herman, but also with Elaine and 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 what it would. And I rec and I, I was 22 at the time, or some 23, I don't know, but I recognized that I was um, welcome. And so to be made welcome, and then to be made welcome, what's the response that I made? So then I, it was my opportunity to, to start to listen, to hear um, how to play, but how to be in the world. Um, I'm working on it, we're all working on it. Um, I'm coming back to it again. But, but there's a way in which uh, the most important thing to do is to hear the voices uh, in the tradition with which uh, we're attempting to speak. We have to, to take a look so that we can free ourselves from any misconceptions we have about what it is to be in the world and what it is to be in the world now. And that's always been the case. I mean, so, you know, so for, about the books that we're, that we're reading, that's always been the case, right? What does it mean to be engaged in this project of, of, of liberating ourselves of these um, things that prevent us from being free? That's circular. It's circular. But, um, and so um, one of those things was, for me, was realizing I just need to learn how to hear better. And once I learned to hear, I'm free to play. 
what does that mean politically? That's a trick. That's a tricky question. But you know, last summer I felt like, oh, I need to, I need to say something. I need to, no, I need to listen. I need to listen. And eventually, somebody's gonna ask me to say something, and I'll, you know, I'll tell you what I heard. Um, and what I, if I start to hear things differently, I'll start to move and speak differently. I'll start to play differently. I'll be engaged. Thank you.